I thought that I would examine, actually, what would be really smart in a city. Uh, what is a smart city? And that's partly, uh, as someone who's been a bit of a bystander, although familiar with the, with the idea and the trope of smart city for some years, uh, it's, it's only recently that I really started thinking, what is a smart city? So here's, here are some ideas, thoughts about smart cities. Well, first of all, obviously, the smart city is a, is a proxy. It's a, it's a paradigm for something else. Uh, it's, it's a trope. And it sums up a huge range of desirables of many kinds. And it's, in that sense, quite like sustainability, really. It's hard to disagree with the proposition that cities should be smart, just like you can't disagree with that they should be sustainable. Uh, and there's always something slightly worrying when you can't disagree with the proposition. Um, Someone once described sustainability as the slipperiest piece of soap in the shower. But at least we know what it is in practice. This is one of the great things about sustainability. We know what it is in practice. We understand it, although theoretically it's difficult to construct a waterproof uh, you know, framework around it. But smart is even more slippery. Uh, and for some, it's all about digitally connected infrastructure that can help operate urban systems you know, and deliver goods to the citizens even before they know them. Uh, they can uh, collect huge amounts of data, uh, and uh, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's a very technological vision. In contrast to these, uh, there are some who stress the social and community dimension, governance and empowerment, and others focus on jobs, competitiveness, growth, catalyzed through programs to create a more skilled population. All of these are fantastic. And actually, many of the ideas that uh, circle around the, uh, the, the world of the smart city are, are brilliant ideas. Uh, I just don't know necessarily whether they're smart. Uh, they're, they're, they can be brilliant and very good, but I want to develop an idea where I, I would like to suggest that... Um, changing the slides is a good idea. Um, I'd like to suggest that, um, that there is actually, throughout urban history, a fantastic number of brilliant ideas and fantastic ideas. And, and what's great is that they, they continue to arise. And that's one of the things that cities are, are really uh, birthplaces of, of fantastic ideas and new ways of living. And that's actually one of the, one of the great things about cities, uh, the, the fact that through uh, agglomeration of, of minds, new things are produced. Here's a city of Jaisalmer founded in the 12th century on the Silk Route in the middle of nowhere. And it, thrived really because of its position in the Silk Route. It was able to do pretty rich and you know, quite often illicit trade. Uh, opium comes to mind, for example. And uh, however, within its defensible walls, there were some uh, extraordinary uh, feats of civilization uh, performed. Uh, it rained five days a year. And despite that, people lived reasonably opulent lives, uh, relying on a very technologically advanced rainwater collection and distribution system, uh, not to mention the remarkably high tolerance of heat that the, uh, the, the citizens developed. Um, there it is in the, the, the old, the, the, the lumpy part there is actually the, uh, the old citadel, uh, and then there's a, there's a bit of minor sprawl around it, not very much. This is the, the water collection tank, which, is, uh, which actually manages to keep the city in water around the whole year. Uh, a culture of, uh, an urban culture of around 40,000 people built up. It's now about 80,000. It had fantastic sophistications, uh, including information systems based on songs that you might hear coming from, from homes, which is reminiscent of the way that Richard Sennett, for example, <clears throat> has described the, uh, the 18th century and 19th century cities. And these songs, for example, would tell you what was going on in a house, what kind of, you know, if there were particular rituals or uh, big events in life, births, deaths, marriages, very great detail about what was going on. Uh, it's kind of social media, really, uh, without the internet. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't say that to belittle uh, social media, actually, quite the reverse. Social media feeds on this uh, um, natural tendency within us. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, or quite soon after, there's a beautiful place there, look, um, 
Here's Jaipur, which is 575 kilometers away in a more fertile part of Rajasthan. I thought I'd just take a very small part of the world, a relatively small part of the world, and just see what, what went on here. Uh, it's a city planned on a grid uh, with a uh, great understanding of both canonic principles, but also modern ideas. It had a huge uh, infrastructure of dealing with flash floods and storms, uh, which actually, as a result of disrepair, is now not performing as well as it used to. Uh, uh, and later in the 19th century, it had a railway sewage system. And uh, you know, one of the greatest things about this place is that it works tremendously functionally normally, but it becomes a theater, a spectacle, because of the way the streets are configured, the way the buildings are either side. The street becomes a, a theater for special events. It's, a, it, it's, it's the cityest of cities, you know, and it's something that's very, uh, very much uh, to be loved about them, and we, we have our own versions of these. You know, London's sewers and the work of Bazalgette, who created a, a, the sewage system that put an end to cholera. It started the cleaning up, clean up of the Thames uh, and anticipated, actually, amazingly, the future scale of demand in London. It was very visionary and forward-looking, and, of course, the London Underground, um, which is, uh, there's the sewers of Bazalgette, the, this great drawing of the London Underground and appearing in stamps, digging underneath the, 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 the city, you know, 150 years ago, uh, and these beautiful stations, and the maps too, on the left the original map, and on the right one of the great feats of graphic design, um, which is the modern underground map. Um, and so these ideas continue. Now, Amsterdam, which is... Uh, advertise itself as Amsterdam's smart city. Uh, it's it's actually it's uh, um, putting in place a very large number of uh, separate projects uh, under the banner of smart, and it categorizes smart in these five categories: living, working, mobility, public facilities, and open data. The last one is, of course, particularly interesting, uh, as well, of course, as investing in, in infrastructure. But I would uh, well, let's just quickly look at those. Um, it's a very nice website, actually, the Amsterdam one. Do have a look. And there are, every one of these is, is a great idea, and many of those are bottom-up, and of course, bottom-up and top-down is one of the big poles of discussion about smart. But I want to suggest that actually, a bundle of things isn't what smart should really be about. And I'm going to suggest that there are five things that smart is really about. Smart is selecting, uh, is, is joining up Oh, sorry, I want to say one thing about data before I do that, and just a stunning example of the ubiquity of data. These are uh, checkout. This is checkout activity in Manhattan supermarkets just before and just after uh, Superstorm Sandy. And these uh, are uh, gleaned from credit card companies, from banks. So nobody went out and measured this, but just from the way people are using the credit cards, you can see immediately how Lower Manhattan has been completely paralyzed by Superstorm Sandy. And this is an example of the level of, of data that is available to us, uh, if only we knew fully how to use it. And I'll, I'll close with that point. Smart is joining up or integrating packages of economic, social, and technological measures so that they work together. For example, planning development or uh, writing development guidance to take into account uh, infrastructure development and its consequences, such as the impact of increased property values, for example, can be factored into, into development and uh, forward projections. Smart, that's number one. Smart is selecting and scaling programs appropriate to each city and town. One thing that has emerged recently is just, uh, you know, especially in the UK, through the work of the Centre for Cities, of whom I am a trustee and Tony uh, is, is, uh, chairs the research panel, or has done, is how different cities are from each other and how the idea that they can all converge to similar levels of growth and so on is not really tenable. And have a look at the, the Centre for Cities uh, City Facts uh, um, app which actually helps you to understand the differences between UK cities in great detail. And it's these differences and this adaptation of measures to actually the scale and the opportunities really in the city is what I would uh, call smart. In some places, for example, you would actually suggest that there'll be zero growth. But rather than lament the zero growth, how do we deal with that? Now, that would be smart. 
Smart is joining up with other cities so that the learning spreads. Uh, these, this beautiful graphic, by the way, is a, is a, is a diagram of, of inter worldwide internet connections. Uh, you can just about see the world emerging underneath that. Uh, so some organizations fear, uh, not so much cities necessarily, the idea of sharing too much information on grounds of competitiveness. But that era of hoarding intellectual property is surely over. And I think one of the, one of the features of the smart city will be open data, open sharing of, of data in this way. Uh, but actually, it does come with a caution. Uh, and I think it requires a kind of a citizenry that is able to, to properly use it. Smart is, this is the hardest bit, smart is thinking uh, in the long term, even when acting in the short term. Uh, now there's a pair of short-termist uh, actions here. Uh, one is uh, building the highway without getting the proper permissions, and the other is being so stubborn that you won't move. Um, just built in China. Um, this, is, this is the hardest part of smart, I think. All the arguments made by organizations like the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, the RIBA, of course, uh, for considering long-term value in designing and constructing buildings are now falling on deaf ears in an era where immediate costs have become the key, key criterion for, um, uh, for public sector contract award. Yes, planning has its unforeseen consequences and more unintended consequences than, than intended ones sometimes, but SMART knows what to plan and what to leave alone. So for example, we have to plan, great, we have to plan, uh, we have to plan for climate change, uh, but there's no point in going berserk and installing uh, immature technologies in buildings in an effort to make them zero carbon uh, now, because that will actually have another kind of lock-in effect, which is it'll inhibit future change to those. Smart would be to start changing people's and corporate behavior, and use public money and purchasing power to kickstart a market and energy efficiency retrofit, which will also provide jobs. A market of the scale that's needed will generate innovations and mature technologies uh, to take us to the next step. And finally, SMART is, and this, I have to say this, and I believe it passionately as an architect and, um, and some, some, uh, an urbanist, we have to recognize what a huge difference the quality of cities, buildings, and spaces makes to people's lives. Everyone recognizes that the quality of opportunities and services is critical to people's happiness, but we don't give enough attention to the settings in which these are delivered, uh, however much we think we do. It wasn't always the case. Look at the pictures I showed earlier. Top-down diktats regarding the design quality of buildings can only go so far. In the long term, we have to, as citizens, become more critical and more empowered thereby more aware of our surroundings. And education from primary school onwards has a big role to play in increasing people's awareness of the visible and invisible structures that surround them, so that as digital networks and open data become so ubiquitous, we actually, as citizens, are smart enough to use it. Thank you. Thank you, Sanand. Um, you talk at the end about open data and the way in which it can make cities function in a smarter way, in a more efficient way. Clearly, you showed the tube map, which clearly allowed people in London to make new decisions about how to get around this city when previously they'd had the other map, which wouldn't have helped very much. Uh, and there was also the Amsterdam example of trying to help people to think rather differently about where they worked. But I suppose the question about data, and you hinted at it yourself, is how democratic it is. I mean, who, who has access to it? Lots of people will want to use these data to, uh, for commercial ends, and therefore will defend them. So how, how's, how, how, how are the citizenry and governments to have access to data in the widest sense that can help them help people live these smarter lives? I think that's a very good question that I'm not sure I'm... Uh, able to entirely answer, but I would just make one observation, which is that generally, secrecy, secrecy of data is overstated. Generally, it's not always. Uh, there are some pretty un bad unintended consequences that I've personally experienced in organizations just from the Freedom of Information Act. But I nevertheless defend the act, although it has those uh, unintended consequences, such as people starting to now hold meetings 
in, in much greater secrecy and writing very terse minutes so that when the, the, the uh, minutes are made available, nobody can really tell what was going on. But, um, so, but, but I think it is generally overstated, that case. The second thing is that I think that, th this is my last point, which is, was my last point, which is that we actually have to ourselves, as citizens, become uh, more capable of understanding and using the data and knowing when it matters and when it doesn't. And a lot of uh, FOR requests, for example, are actually not really for information, they're for other reasons. And as citizens, we too hold some of these numbers, some of this data as well, don't we? I mean, some of the data that cities might use is held by people using their smartphones and tracking their smartphones even more interestingly yeah. and complicatedly. Yeah, I anyway. agree with that. Okay, thank you, Sanan. Thank you very much.